Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Usain Robert, and this is The Trend Show, a show that gives you a thousand plus one reasons why everything can be done and is possible. All you need to do as individual is to invest a lot more time on it, whatever you're doing, and just be persistent on it. Now, today, uh, because this is the discussion we've been having on matters entrepreneurship and just how to make uh, the entrepreneur field be uh, good for the upcoming investors and youths and uh, people that just want to practice something in the field. Now, we are talking at a time where we have a lot of uh, political discussions across the board and uh, you understand that in, in this country, every time that we are having political discussion and so on and we are approaching a general election, uh, many people, many a times who are having businesses, they tend to uh, res have some reservation in terms of hiring employees and so on, and even widening their uh, their landscape of business or their territories because of the uncertainties that comes with it at times. But again, when that is happening, life does not come to a stay, a standstill. People does not stop living and wait till elections pass. The World Bank has given out a data showing that uh, the upper northern part of Africa is leading in terms of unemployment cases, having their percentage stable. At 30 percent, that was a data released by 2019, and also showing that in East Africa, and part of it is we are, the employment is stable at the about 8.7 percent and so on. And that is also something that is kind of encouraging. Now, today, Africa is having a lot of challenges. As uh, rates of corruption increasing so on and uh, in my discussion today uh, I'm having a, a Mwalimu, a lecturer teaching at uh, the School of Business, uh, someone that has done a lot and uh, having studied at a uh, uh, University of Technology Mara in Malaysia, having a degree in business, focusing on strategic management and marketing and also having done a lot of researches, contribution to several new magazines and so on and research sites and journals. Molimu, thank you so much for the show uh, and I'm really grateful. While we are discussing the bottom-up mod economic model and trickle-down and so on, uh, behind uh, the wheelbarrow there is an economic model. Uh, my name is Zephania Daisai Opati. Okay. I'm a lecturer by profession. I teach marketing and strategic management. I'm also a PhD candidate at St. Paul's University and I teach here at Riara University. I also double up as the head of department, School of Business, but my main interest is basically on strategy and marketing. Okay. Yes. Uh, how to make Africa work and Kenya specifically in our country. That is the topic that is uh, cutting across the board. Uh, from each political party or groupings and so on. We want to make Kenya work in terms whereby the normal Mwanainchi will get have money in their pockets to sustain them. Mm -hmm. But again, politics affects that in one, way or the way, in one way or another and so on. So I wanted us to, I wanted you to address this issue of bottom-up economic model that has been proposed and is a discussion that is cutting across right now as we're speaking. First, the definition, because I know general publics, a number, a greater percentage, does not exactly know what it is and how it works. Okay, from my perspective, because looking at the politics that is in this uh, discussion, there are different definition of the same. Okay. But basically, from what I understand, mm. Uh, basically, what they're trying to do is to show up the common man so as to improve the well-being of the general population of Kenya from that approach, which means focuses on the common man. But the same also is on the other side of uh, trickle-down. They're also talking about getting resources to the common man, but basically I think the the... ODM approach is to focus on the counties as a way of bringing in economic development at the lower, lowest level of the common man. Okay. So for the bottom-up approach, the way I'm seeing it, may focus on getting the people 
uh, resources or getting the people, let me put it this way, getting the people empowered so as to actualize meaningful living. Mm. And I tend to think from what I've studied, I tend to think it came from the issue of uh, Grameen Bank in Indonesia, where an economic professor was saddened by the way the women in Indonesia were being used by, or were being uh, taken advantage of by Shylocks. Okay. So from his point of view, he started helping one lady at a time so as they can be able to overcome those poverty challenges. And they were able to create um, uh, an insurance fund for the common people in Indonesia, the Mamamboga or such in that area. They were able to give them information uh, or communication. They were able to partner up with mobile phones because these women were not, were not able to communicate with vendors from the market and know what the price is. So they were able to give them mobile phones that were cheaper and they could be able to sustain their business. So insurance came in, uh, getting rid of the Shylock loan, uh, loans came in. They were able to, able to communicate with suppliers to get into the market. So the bottom line of it is that both of these uh, citations or proposals are looking at how to help the common man. It is a good model to have in an economy. But now we are talking about Africa, where every single day when you hear people talk, corruption is, is really ravaging our economy mm. and so on. And uh, lack of accountability for the political people, uh, our political leaders, mm -hmm. uh, no one is no one wants to be accountable because there is no one to hold you accountable. Mm -hmm. Because you find out that at the end of the day, whoever mm -hmm. wants to hold you accountable also has a tag on their, mm -hmm. on their neck. Because yes. they have also done something wrong mm -hmm. or they have also looted from the other end. And therefore, if you point fingers at them, they also f point the same finger back at you and mm -hmm. tell you, how about you? You did the same thing. No one complained. No one talked. Yeah. If we were to apply the uh, bottom up, economic model in our society, in this country, with all the factors, putting all the factors, having them in mind, mm -hmm. uh, starting with corruption, do you think it would work? The most uh, question that's not being addressed by uh, bottom-up and even the trickle-down effect, mm. dealing with the issue of resources, mm. that how are we able to marshal the resources mm. so that we're able to help the common man. Mm. And corruption is also part of the issue because uh, the president once said that we lose two billion shillings billion. per day yeah. in corruption. Mm. And if you find that amount of money that can be used in, for example, health insurance for all Kenyans, availability of health, uh, health facilities or maybe health services to all Kenyans d despite your financial status, mm. that can go away to help, yes. to help lots of people. Yeah. Right now you're talking about corona and the average bill you're talking about for someone who has gone through a corona uh, experience up to ICU mm. is coming closer to one million. Now if this happens to a family, then that fa family is improvised. Definitely. Getting back to their feet economically, probably they've sold land probably they've sold a car or sold whatever they have to deal with the bill. Yes. But you can imagine, this is just corona, but there are several other cases that are coming in, issues of cancer, issues of, uh, you know, very many diseases that common man uh, uh, gets, gets to, fee to feed the bill because we don't have such access. So as much as we are proposing all these economic models, mm we need to deal with the elephant in the room. And that's how do we deal with corruption and how do we deal with the debt issue that is facing the Kenyans at this stage. If this government were to work, uh, use this bottom-up economic model, and uh, let's say they have handled the issue corruption, fin this financial year, the budget was around three point something. Mm -hmm. 
and we talk about how many people are we talking about when we want to give them each a hundred. Uh, are we dealing with it per region or will we deal with it per region or in a whole country at once or uh, per county or who is, where is these resources coming from? Is it coming from the national government or the county government or how, how do you think it would work? That's, that's a challenge. Yeah? Mm. And for me, from my perspective, from where I sit, mm. I think the former president's model, if I may call that the Kibaki model, mm. was the one that is best suited to help us move out of this issue. Okay. Kibaki, uh, in his wisdom, mm. drafted the 2030 vision. And we have moved away from it. Uh, the 2030 vision was supposed to increase the number of middle income earners mm. from lower, or let me put it, from lower extreme poverty levels mm. to increase the number of middle income earners. The economy is boosted, moreover, by middle class mm. than the poor or the super rich, okay? Mm. If you look at it this way, mm. the poor people don't spend so much in an economy. The middle class spend. And studies have shown all over, yes. and you can even allude to the Malaysian Vision 2020, I don't know if they've achieved it, mm. but the Malaysian Vision 2020 was to increase the number of middle income earners so that you have lower or fewer poor people. What it means is when I bring the middle income people in, these are the people who spend in the economy. Sure. The rich spend elsewhere. They go to a trip in Dubai, they buy their clothes from Paris, you know, they buy their cars from Germany. But the middle class people, when they spend in an economy, they go to the normal supermarkets. Sure. These supermarkets employ people they take their kids to private schools. These private schools oh, employ yeah. teachers, yes. employ workers. They buy cars. These cars, you know, a shop attendant has a, 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 super, a supermarket and even what we call it, a mechanic yeah, has a job. job. Yeah. So when you're focusing on these guys, you create a ripple effect towards the whole economy. So that somebody who was not working, assuming it's a student who came from school, yes. gets to the middle in class, uh, middle in class uh, stage, mm. will be able now to hire a house, mm. or let's say let rent. rent a house. Yes. Okay, when you rent a house, somebody who's in construction is getting, is a, job. getting a job or yeah. the construction uh, industry is, is now booming yes. because there is a demand for houses. Yes. There is a demand for cars. There is a demand for supermarkets. There is a demand for schools. Yeah. There is a demand for clothes. Yeah. And all these uh, sectors are, are, are now brought into to work in the economy. Yeah. So that was the approach of creating the Vision 2030, that every government uh, ministry had the Vision 20 project. The Ministry of Roads was supposed to tarmac several thousand kilometers of roads to, uh, to increase the access, the access of, uh, of, and of goods and resources and people moving. Yeah. So I think for us, we've missed it when we left the Vision 2030. If Konza City was working, several universities, I understand one was from Korea, several startups company like Google will be there. Yes. This means the gig economy will be working because or will be more boosted with that infrastructure in Konza City and the technology that we have, because now the youth who are so keen on the gig economy will come in. Yes. So for me, I think, I wish we had followed the vision 2030 and focus on creating the middle class or remove people from the poor sector or yeah. poor segment yeah. of, the, of the pyramid yes. to increase the middle class uh, uh, people who pay tax. Yes. They are, these are the guys, by the way, who pay lots of taxes. In most people, for most people employed, they pay 30% yeah, of definitely. the taxes. Definitely. So if we're able to increase these, uh, mm. and 
sorry, the focus is on Mama Mboga, but I think for now, Mama Mboga doesn't need uh, handouts. Yeah. He needs customers. The moment he gets customers, she'll, so she'll be able to expand. Yes. And the customers are people who can be able now to work, who are these guys from the middle class. So we move guys from lower to middle class, people were able to spend within that economy. Okay. So I think that for me that was, that should be the bottom line. Whatever the model mm -hmm. focus is, how do we remove poor people into the middle the class brackets, the middle class. they can be able to spend within the economy. They go to Naivasha for, for vacation. Yeah. Hotels in, uh, in Naivasha have the business, get how, how yes, work. have work. So I think that is the, the, the way to go. Now, that is now Kenya. Look at it in the perspective of Africa. The economy of the late Robert Mugabe. Yes. How will that economy work? What I'm Just thinking. Just to help it grow, yeah. Yes, to help it grow. Yeah. The major thing, I think, uh, we need to follow what the corporates have done. Yeah. Corporates have redefined their business. Sure. And this is the challenge with Kenya. And I also feel the same needs to be uh, incalculated in these economic models, mm. we need to redefine our business. Mm. Uh, if I ask you, for example, mm. how do you put six Hondas in one room? At first, when you think about it, you think about six cars. How do you put six CRVs or Honda Fit in yeah. one room? Yeah. But the model that Honda as a company took was to focus on the engine. So they don't focus on the car, they focus on the engine. Okay. So specialty arises out of focusing on the engine and you create a Honda car CRV, you have a generator, a small engine, you have a ski, you have a power saw, you have, um, now even they have a plane, okay? You have um, a motorboat, the same from Honda model. So you can put those in one room. You can have a car, you can have a motorcycle, you can have a ski, you can have a generator, you can have a power saw, all these things in one room. So what they did was to, instead of focusing on creating motorcycle, because even in Kenyan, uh, uh, you know, population, when people say you have a Honda, it used to be a motorcycle. Yeah. So the focus was, if we create engines for all these things, we can ask someone else to bring the tires for us. We focus on just making a best engine out of it. Okay. So coming to Kenya, mm. Safaricom has borrowed this model. Mm. In a sense that Safaricom business at first was communication. Mm. But Safaricom has redefined the business to transaction. Now they transact data. They transact money. They even now transact airwaves. So using the SIM card, yes. instead of using the SIM card just to communicate, you can use the SIM card to send SMS, mm. you can use the SIM card to get money mm. in terms of transaction, you can use the SIM card for data, but they've opened a big approach of making money for themselves. No wonder it's the, the most profitable company in East and Central Africa. Now, countries have followed the same thing and I'm praying and hoping that Africa can do the same. India has changed or defined tourism into health tourism. A tourist coming from Europe to stay for a week in a hotel in India, you have a tourist coming because he has cancer and he wants to be treated and you'll come with two or three people. The patient will be treated in India, yes. but the caretakers will be housed in a hotel. The people in hotel get a job. Get a job. Yeah. The, somebody in that hotel will get a job as a watchman, as a cleaner, and all that. The owner also gets yes, the rent. Yes, the owner gets the rent. Yeah. So at the, end of, at the end of the day, you find that India has redefined tourism. The same with Thailand. In fact, Thailand has 2.5 million, pre-COVID, 2.5 million health tourists coming to Thailand. And the output that we are talking about in Asia is over 100 billion US dollars. Mm. 
Mm. And most of the Asian countries are, are picking that. Mm. So if we have to redefine our economy, we have to yeah. look at, for example, Australia and even Malaysia. Let me pick Australia. Mm. Australia, the e education industry was bringing $40 billion pre-COVID, oh. which means a student who is a tourist yeah. comes to stay there for four, Good year. four years. Yeah. Every month, Rent. They pay rent because buy their food. parents are sending the, money. sending the money. They buy food. They buy food. They service the local economy. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you have an income coming in for four years instead of going for that uh, tourist from Europe who comes here for three days or a week. Back. Yes. Mm. So if you look at that, it becomes div the, the other extremes. Las Vegas. The people come there to gamble. Las Vegas pre-COVID had 42 million tourists per year. Just gambling. They come to gamble. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say, are we able, for example, to turn Kenyatta Hospital into a regional hospital? hospital. We have seen cases of presidents being treated in Kenya. Yeah. If we can be able to manage to get around our region, instead of focusing on the tourist who comes here for one. We, we still uh, hunt for that, huh? but we now focus on putting Kenyatta Hospital mm. as a regional, we fund it as a government, we fund it. We put uh, facilities that are, you know, uh, latest technology there. So instead of people going to India, even from the region, they come to Kenya. They'll stay here for two, day, uh, two weeks a month. Means the people who are in the hotel business mm. will be able to get some money out of it instead of just relying on the right. on the uh, the tourists. Uh, I mean, on the common tourist. Mm. This will be a ripple effect across the economy. Sure. Transport industry people need you know for transport. Yeah. Hotel industry, clothes. You know, you need some few things. Even pharmaceuticals uh, companies may now start coming to Kenya as investors because we have a very huge uh, population of people are being treated here. So for me, I think we need to redefine our business. Kenya is known for as a cradle of mankind, but we've never taken the initiative. And I, I remember during the inauguration, the first inauguration of President Uhuru and uh, Deputy President Ruto, Ruto says, when you come to Kenya, you must say, welcome home. Yeah. So how are we not tapping into turning this nation as a tourist destination for people who want to look at archaeology? Sure. We target them. Turkana becomes an open space where you come to see those fossils. And people who are from other universities, other countries interested in this, should be facilitated to come in and have their sight on such kind of fossils, which we've never done. The same thing e Egypt is doing. Very many people go there to see the pyramids. Yeah. So it's the same advantage we can take mm. to ensure that Lodwa, you know, mm. uh, these places where they have these archaeology artifacts have a very good uh, population of tourists coming in. So I think the best way, if I may put it in a summary, is we need to redefine our tourism or our economy. People move, our resources move where there is people. Sure. So if we have tourists coming in, in the health sector, education sector, for example, mm. we put our universities, best place, research places, and even, you know, education standards higher, we can attract to, uh, students from the region. So that, that, for me, is the focus, rather than just focusing on the poor, because the moment you focus on these sectors, you create a ripple effect in the, and in the, the job sector. Grow, yes. Consequently. Yes. We are talking about the redefinition of our economy. Yes. For a very long time, Africa, not Africa, but Kenya, agricultural based economy, yes. where we are known for the, the biggest country leading in production of coffee and export of coffee, yes. and, and so on and so forth. Yeah? Whereas that is happening, you mm -hmm. still find that the people who are working in those coffee farms and the tea farms and so on in Kenya mm -hmm. and so on, 
they are living some of the worst life situ situations. Mm -hmm. At the moment, they were given the house. They have been given the houses mm -hmm. where they're staying, which is not, which cannot really accommodate a whole family. Yes. But again, even you realize that they find very find it very hard to support their children mm -hmm. to undergo the education. Why do you think this is not working? Because working, be, being that we are an agricultural based economy, it mm -hmm. really means that we need to be doing a lot yes. in that. And if you could be doing one of the, the in a working and taking advantage of that, what is the government or the leadership or the corporates doing in that? Africa mm. is going to be poor mm. or continuously it will be poor because mm. we don't do value addition. Mm. And he was giving a case study of Uganda mm. where somebody mm. goes fishing I gets a dollar, about 100 bob, mm. from the fish, but the same fish fillet is sold in Europe at $100. So you see 100 times the value. Yeah. So the issue is the value addition. When, when you look at the addition of value, it creates opportunities along the way. Yeah. So from fish fillet, I mean from fish, you're able to package you're able to put fish fillet. So at the end of the day, it adds value and creates job along the value chain. So that instead of focusing on just producing the raw material and sending it away, and creating jobs on the other side. Because once we have the coffee, yeah. it's taken to a factory somewhere in Germany or in Britain, whatever, yeah. whatever place. Yeah. And the factory is able to process that yeah. whole thing, yes. package, market, sell, creating a very wide variety of jobs in, on the opportunities for people who are the living, other side, yeah. yes. Okay. Whereas at the end of the day, we remain here, yes. jobless and still complaining, yes. as usual. Mm -hmm. in, in, in Africa, would you mention the resources that you think uh, and the, 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 the areas that you can, we need to focus on? Like we'd say, uh, for instance, let's talk of, uh, we'd say, let up Kenya focus on it will be best if Kenya focus on education or health than Uganda, which is currently producing uh, very a lot of eggs and so on, and the cost of production over there is a little bit lower than our uh, our side. Mm -hmm. What should we focus on for Kenya? Mm. And I think this is applies for Africa. We have the resources. Mm. Challenge is the people. Mm. I think we need to focus on people or human development, okay. human resource development. Take for instance, uh, Malaysia. Their top A students don't study there. So if you are a A student who want to study engineering, you're taken to Germany. Yes. If you are an A student who wants to study medicine, you're taken to India, India. or US, yes. pharmacy. Yes. If you are a technology student, you're taken to Japan. So what do they do? They tap into the knowledge of these economies. Then they bring them back. So these people are able to work because the, the idea is not just resources. Yeah. It is the human uh, resource that we are talking about. The moment you have the skill to come up with a new app, maybe you've seen it in Germany yeah. and you're able to develop it here, you create a string of jobs. The moment we're able to have pharmacy uh, students coming in and saying we need to think of coronavirus and how do we treat it with our local resources, yes. then we stop importing and we start buying our own. And if it's working, we can even export. Yes. So my challenge is, or my, my thought is, as Africans we focus on the raw materials and somebody say the greatest land we have is between our ears. So that we develop these skills. So like what equity, I really admire what equity is doing. Yeah. Taking students to the uh, Ivy League universities college. Yes. But then we bring them back. To help. So for me, I think the, the trick is this two way. Redefine our economy to bring people in. But also focus on talent development to tap 
we take our, our students out. In any case, then we bring them back mm. so that they can serve this economy. In any case, if they're also outside, they're working from there, the remittance money. that we are getting from the diaspora, yes. it's quite huge. Sure. I understand it's over 300 billion Kenya shillings per year, sure. which can fund a ministry for a whole year. So I think the two things, we take people out mm. to get the skills, and then we redefine our economy or our business so that we bring people in to service our economy. The, the, the upcoming youths, the youths that would want to venture into entrepreneurship and so on, mm -hmm. what are some of the avenues that are very uh, already available for them that they can tap into for their uh, entrepreneurial advancement and growth? For the youth, the major issue is the talent. Yeah. And I think one of the challenges we have as a, even as an economy yes. is the issue of acknowledging talents. If you are a baseball, uh, baseball player, you use your talent to get a living. Okay. If you are a, you know, a swimmer, you use your talent to get your, your living. You can swim and you make money. Sure. So for the youth, and that's what we need to focus on, as much as we are taking them out or bringing people in, what is it that we have? Uh, I understand the word, of, the word talent. In the Bible, talks about 32 kilograms of gold. That guy who hid one, yes, one talent. One talent. Yes. It's equivalent of 32 kilograms of gold. The Olympic gold medal now is around, I think, six grams, if I'm not wrong. But equivalent to, is it a, a I can't remember the amount, but it's, it's a equi equivalent to a hundred or 200,000, the six grams. So you can imagine how much is 32 kilograms of gold, which means even if I take the talent and I purify, which means it needs to be purified, yes. if it's swimming, I, I yeah, do the work exercise, I work on it yes. to purify it, yes. it should be able to give me a living. So that is the, the, the issue, I think, about the youth. We focus so much on education, but there is a talent in running. The guys who are in Olympics now, yeah. they're doing us proud, yeah. are runners, okay? The guys who are saving us from the COVID are doctors. They use that knowledge, yeah. okay? The guys who came up with ventilators from KU and you know all these universities yeah. are using their talent. The only thing we'll ask of the government is maybe support, yeah. support our local talent. If they can make a ventilator, why can't we improve it? Why can't we bring in an expert to make it better so that we can be able even to export it? Uh, I've seen drones being used in, uh, in Rwanda to drop medicine, yeah. but that is a talent someone is using. The same thing can be done here. In our so I, yes, in our country. Yes. So I think talent development and acknowledging the economy as, as a little bit wide, not just focusing on education, that can be the key to open up the economy for everyone within Kenya. I think that another question I would want to ask you, mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about the African economy. Mm -hmm. What are some of the factors or another factor that will be affecting the economy from growing, just generally Africa? Major factors are are uh, imp impeding the growth of African economies. May mention two. One is the intra-trade barriers set up by African governments themselves that you are not able to trade uh, with, uh, with other countries very easily. For instance, mobility in Africa is so uh, difficult, while in Europe, for example, you can very easily move from one country to another, which means you can move resources from freely and people freely. Yeah. But in Africa, for example, we find that the air ticket from here to Dubai is the same as air ticket from here to Rwanda. Sure. So you wonder what is the, the issue, but mostly uh, taxes that tend to disrupt this. Mm -hmm. But of essence, when you talk about Rwanda, the other factor that may be hindering is the protectionism. And most times these developed countries tend to 
protect their own economies in a way. Yeah. Uh, if I may give the example of Rwanda, Rwanda uh, trying to bring up its nascent um, uh, clothing and textile industry banned Mitumba from US. Yeah. And we had Trump putting sanctions on a smaller country like Rwanda because they were not or they decided not to import Mitumba. Mitumba brings lots of issues because for them it's a disposal issue, environmental. Yeah. But now Africa is a way where they can dump it easily. Yeah. But once we accept Mitumba, we kill our cotton industry yeah. and we kill our textile industry. Yeah. So Rwanda has, has come out of it and they're able to uh, have entrepreneurs, designers, young people, you know, the, the, the youth generation, design clothes for them. Uh, I saw this one who's designing for the president, he's a very young man. Yeah, so he's designing the, uh, the, the clothes for the, for the president like that. I've even seen with our president adorning, you know, local, local shirts. Yes. But that's the way to go, uh, uh, trying to avoid the protectionism by the, you know, by the developed countries. Mm -hmm. Because whatever is good for them and it's hurtful to Africa, they don't care. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But they will try as much as possible to frustrate the efforts of African governments yeah. to develop these industries that can employ very many people. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for attending. Now, as the teachers just mentioned here, you using your talent appropriately. This is the trend show where we give you all more than a thousand plus one reasons why things can be done. And always remember that you're the captain of your ship and the master of your fate. The decision that you make and how you purify your talent makes you who you become tomorrow. Thank you so much. And this is the trend show. We'll be having our Malimu again next time. And for today, this is a wrap. And thank you so much for you creating time to attend uh, the train show. Thank you. And I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you.